let me start with where I come from. Disruptions, disruptions or dime a dozen. I, I teach the subject of management control system in IIM Bangalore. And in that, I look at how organizations look at disruptions and uh, how they handle, how they cope with, how they manage, and more importantly, this is more important, that how do they leverage from disruptions? The whole discussion, the narrative, started with a book by Christensen on what is dis <coughs> innovative disruptions. And before that, he had written articles and papers on innovative technology, disruptive technologies, and all that. So from that, it became a pattern to talk about disruptions and how these are useful to organizations and how they should really look at positively and like that. Now, it has become so much that I won't be surprised if organizations really open, let's say, center of excellence in disruption. So many times I've heard people saying that, I mean, let, <clears throat> I'm just waiting for a crisis. If it happens, you know, I'll fix this problem, I'll fix that problem and like that. So it's as if, like, you know, you need a crisis to really even solve your problem rather than really handling it proactively. This is the theme of my talk today. And in fact, I'll give you a job offer if you people, if it interests you all. The job offer is that, I mean, there's a position, manager disruption. You'll have quarterly targets, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll have, uh, you will be evaluated, and you will be incentivized also. Your ideas really create disruptions, and then make innovations happen. How, the, how does that appeal to you? Now, obviously, you know, it will look like very counterproductive and counterintuitive. And there are other papers now to say that, listen, there are a lot of disruptions, there are a lot of innovations. It's not necessary that all the dis disruptions lead to innovations. It's not necessary that all the innovations last long also. So you need to really balance out and take a very proper perspective rather than just taking it as a you know, God-given theory or something like that, you know. <coughs> So my, again, continuing my talk, I looked at what can be uh, examples of disruptive innovations and in technology and like that. You can think of hundreds. I mean, these days really obvious. Like there are this zero da, which really shook up that broking community. Then there is the policy bazaar, which shook up the in <coughs> insurance industry. I used to keep asking the insurance people, I mean, who among you will be the Amazon? Who among you will be the Flipkart? But none of them became, but somebody from outside became the policy bazaar.com they started. This is again the crux of what the Christensen wrote. It's Christensen's uh, <coughs> narrative that the actual disruptions may not actually come from the existing incumbent firm. They could be large, they could be multinational, they could be large corporates. It actually comes from startups or somebody outside the industry who suddenly sees a niche in your, <coughs> in your product line and what Christensen calls it as a blind spot in your strategy or blind spot in your plan and then somebody exploits that and suddenly he poses a very very veritable threat to you so that's the meaning of disruption disrupt innovation disruptive technologies and all that so but I was trying to think for you students something outside the technology world I mean is it all technology disruption is it all technology because intuitively we keep ten you know, equate with technology only, because there can be process innovation, there can be supply chain innovation, disrupt innovations, I mean, which can really disrupt the existing way that things are all, you know, distributed and processed and like that. And there can be disruptive products also, okay, which are non-technology products. So one of the classic examples, let me take multiplex. So I think probably in 2000 or maybe before that, suddenly the theater started losing audience. So there were worries that will the theaters can survive this techno technological th I mean, threat from the home theaters and other later opportunities and like that. That time even Netflix and all were not there. And suddenly came this multiplex. If I am not wrong, I think it came in Europe. And the multiplex when it came, it provided a great contrast to the earlier version of theaters that I don't know, you people may not even see in the youngsters who are probably less than 20 and like that. Because those days, what do you do? You go to your theater, and you hate the lighting, you hate the mu sound, and come back with a headache, isn't it? So obviously, why will somebody go for all that? But the multiplex changed all that. In the multiplex, what do you have? You go for an experience. You buy a theater ticket for 200 rupees, buy popcorn for 500 rupees, enjoy the movie, and then hang around in the multiplex, 
and then you come back. Isn't it? It's a very pleasant experience. You go with the family and you book online. Isn't it? I mean, what more you can really ex expect? That's an experience. That's what I meant when I said disruptive technology, where actually it revived the theaters, you know, and we missed all those old theaters, in fact. Okay. And then you had organic food. Organic food were always there. Even my grandmother used to give me organic food when I was like you, chill, <coughs> you students. But then imagine the sort of supply chain that has come up for the whole organic chain, organic food. And it's now probably global also. And there's even an online trading happening. And it's now threatening the regular markets. So all the corporates are now going for the organic food marketing like that. So it's not just organic food is the fad. Now it has become fad also. But it, the whole supply chain has really developed and it's really breaking new grounds and like that. T20. So I was born on the side of Chaipok grounds in Triple K in Chennai. Okay. And for us, three-day Ranji matches, five-day test matches are religion. Okay. We used to go there with family. We used to enjoy our pongal in the Chaipok grounds. And you know that's a test of the capability of the cricketer that we all see the bowlers and cricketers like that. Okay. Now what has happened? Suddenly the T20 came. Suddenly, maybe after many decades of, you know, many decades of uh, Friday cricket matches, and then a decade of one-day matches. Suddenly the T20 comes. Okay, and uh, for a traditionalist like us, we cannot still stomach it. Okay, in the sense that listen, but how can you test somebody in 20, you know, 20 overs? I mean, is that game at all? Is it cricket at all? Isn't it? I mean, can you have a Hockey matches decided by penalty corners. You know, that's what, that's way we would argue and like that. I mean, you know, T20 is something like that. But what is more disconcerting is that, not only that I'm proved wrong, it has become so popular now. Nobody goes for the five-day matches and it's only T20 matches. So we are in the world of Twitter and T20s, isn't it? I mean, that's something, I, I mean, <clears throat> I'm not reconciled to, but I don't worry about because I'm already old anyway, you know. But uh, this is what is disruptive technology and disruptive innovation that people are talking about. Believe me, I'm in the education field for probably last 30 years, including my PhD career. And uh, I was trying to think of some innovation in education. It really fails me. Okay, I don't consider this online education education because what I'm doing offline, we are doing it online. Okay, we are not really even modified. Our, is, is there any new way of teaching we are doing? I really doubt it. And it's just technology, that's all. You know, professors have not changed, students have not changed. Maybe Corona made some changes to it. We are all back to our own old ways and like that. Okay, so I'm waiting for some disruption in education when probably maybe students may stop attending classes or I don't know what will be the disruption that it can really pose me. But that's still a place where we all keep talking about disruption, but we don't have. Now, imagine, I mean, you know, often uh, this is again my simple point I'm going to be speaking on. I'll give you five areas where we really get disrupted day to day, but we are not able to handle. So my hypothesis is do have an eye for smaller persistent disruptions, okay? Don't keep waiting for disasters. Don't keep waiting for crisis. Don't keep waiting for recessions, okay? My point is that imagine, let's say, a board meeting happening. I mean, it, I've seen it also. I was in the board of a bank. There's a fly whizzing around the chairman's nose and <laughs> head. Entire board attention will be on that. Agenda can go to hell. You know, the next quarter can go to hell. People will get distracted by that. So that's a sort of sometimes obsessions we have about some of these persistent things, but we just don't know how to handle this. I'm just, that's more on the lighter side. More on the serious side, look at it. I mean, the corporates can handle external threats. It can handle competition. It can handle regulation. It can handle policy changes. It can handle global disruptions. But internally, they all shy away. Why? Because if it is external threat, we all pull together. The people muster all the powers. They, they can muster all the resources, and they know how to handle. But internally, it's a no-go area. You know, you people can challenge me, and I can prove myself. I mean, you know, and look at it again. I mean, we are all told right from school days that stitching time saves nine stitching time and all, but that comes very low in the pecking order. If you really see, like, what is the stitching, <coughs> stitching time and like that. Now, again, we are told Rolling Stone gathers no mass, stay put, and then gather you only mass. I mean, I've seen that, suppose, in my own career. I mean, 
there was one leader who said that he was he was in world bank he was in uh, <clears throat> he was in editor of a newspaper he was uh, <clears throat> then he joined politics he became an mp leader then he became again started book publishing again me i was i started my career in government then i went to i am amdabad for education then i was in consulting software dot com again back to education now i am setting up a public policy school in jain university so, I, i mean a startup at the age of 65 and like that okay so i mean now there are theories which says that a person who changes more jobs okay he gather he he gathers more managerial abilities and leadership abilities is more adaptable than somebody who stick to the same place for 20 years and like that so this is again a disruption why that's what i'm going to take you for the next five five slides and like that so it's like even bradman we used to say he never played home away series isn't it i mean a home away from anything you know <clears throat> it's a disruption for us and we always try to postpone shy or leave it like that you know so this is a, this is the simple point that i'm trying to make in my whole presentation like that and so to begin with first thing they say is that can you confront reality disruption is confronting reality okay now when i say reality i don't mean there is a reality out there and you are shying away from facing it and you don't know, you know what it is no i'm not saying that i'm saying there are multiple realities right now for example can somebody tell me are we going through a recession is there any chance the next quarter we make it a reception reception recession next uh, is there probably a recession in us will it transform you know transfer itself to india so all these things are realities people keep talking about like that okay now the question is there are these multiple realities and <clears throat> you choose what's the reality that suits you so if somebody else may make construct another reality so what are we are talking about reality at least in the economic world corporate world and the student life is probably the reality that you are constructed for yourself but are you willing to explore the realities is a question that i'm really asking what what we call as the scenario building in the corporates and are you willing to consider even the worst case scenarios and like that you know or just get bogged down with the worst case scenario which is also worse you know so that's the point i'm trying to make here and what has happens in the corporates i was on the board of a bank was telling you we all get very sanitized report we get very sanitized reality suppose we were handling at that time let's say npa non performing assets so, so so the sort of figures that we get there will be very different from what is talked about outside and we know that firms are all not doing great and then how are doing of course all those things got now i mean i can say cleaned up but that as of that stage it was all only sanitized <laughs> okay and uh, then again but the leaders ability if you ask me is to really construct realities construct realities for his corporate construct realities for his country construct realities for his state and the teachers realities to really construct a future for the for the student so that's where your ability and then are they willing to buy that and is that really realistic enough so that's the sort of thing that i would really look at it but some of not many could i mean you can not name really many who can do that most of them really just stick to realities and struggle with realities and like that you know <coughs> yeah <coughs> sorry so another disruption that i really talk about is i mean you're all in the learning phase the biggest challenge we keep talking about can you unlearn okay imagine kohli i mean so he was a century maker and he has been a consistent player just for one or two season probably he couldn't crack any century then people started telling oh he has to change his batting stance he has to change his you know uh, <clears throat> this particular stroke he has to change his uh, i mean <clears throat> is the way that he stands and things like that people started really prescribing for him you know and he is any day more specialist but kohli is kohli so probably i don't know he didn't take all their advice but he did take some advices and practice in the net practice and he bounced back you know but that's unlearning in fact i used to get one very funny example i can tell you from my own life so i'll go to us maybe let's say i land in new york 
I come out of the airport, I take a cab, okay, I immediately go and sit on the driver's seat. Okay, because left hand drive and right hand drive. You know, the driver will immediately tease me, sir, you want to drive it, you drive it, no problem, sir. I'll sit through, no, 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 I don't want to drive. And uh, so that's unlearning, it's very difficult. By chance, let's say you are driving in US for two years, take a bet, you cannot drive in Bangalore, you know. Bec one, not only the traffic part, but also changing from left hand to right hand to right hand driving to left hand drive like that. That's one example of, you know, I can think of which you can all relate to when I say unlearning. Now you think from the organizational context, how complex it can be. It can be about your strategy, it can be on your leadership, its style, it can be about your culture. All these things poses really a great challenge and like that. And it, many times, I mean, what you call as a organizational culture, what you say is not done here, it's done here, this is what we are and all, can lead to diminishing utility as you go further. I mean, you need to change that also and you need to revisit also. So it's not that simple, I mean, you know. And uh, I will ask, <clears throat> again, everybody is really fighting for the cha relevance, whether it is, you know, let's say a product is fighting for its relevance in the new market, the process of fighting for the relevance in the new supply chain system. You know, like that I can just keep adding. I mean, probably even your structure is outdated. So how do you really keep revisiting? That's what is the challenge. I will give you all one challenge to the students. You all been learning in particular. We, each one of you would have, have your own way of learning. And then you know how you are performing. If you think there is something you need to change, why don't you try to do that? Try to do that and see how you fare. Then you will appreciate what I'm saying, you know. Otherwise, it look very simple, but you also try. Then you will know where you stand and like that, I mean, you know. <coughs> Again, disruption. Many times we say that, I mean, <coughs> there is a saying you all remember. I mean, it says that uh, be careful about what you wish for. So it's like winner's curse. I mean, I've seen many times, many corporates, after winning a tender, they don't know what to do, how to proceed, and then whether they've got really a... You know, <clears throat> it's a blessing or a curse. Okay, that's what we call as winner's curse. And uh, I, have, I handle some cases in my management control system and in organizational theories and all that. I take cases of mergers and acquisitions. So the merger has happened and uh, people are, <clears throat> I mean, on the day one, the problem starts. On day one, the cultural mismatch, the process mismatch, product mismatch and all those things. And then you really, and then probably 40% of the mergers could have been divested later. Okay. The, and then I'll tell you, I tell all my students, you know, they have got dream jobs, and I tell them, do just do a survey. After a year, how many of them stay in their dream jobs? Okay. So this is again something you, I mean, you know, you need to learn to handle. And there are theories now, like people say, I want the star profile, but after getting it, they keep struggling with him. You know. So this is again a challenge that corporates are try to figure out their articles in Harvard Business Review on star profiles and how do they perform and like that. You know? And then many times, even the gold medalist, after getting it, he doesn't know what he should do next. Okay? And that's the sort of uh, confusion people raise. That's again sort of a vacuum, I would call, not much so much of a disruption, but definitely a vacuum you've got. And finally, I would say that uh, disruption lies in implementing a resolution. How many resolutions you would have passed you on your life and uh, where do you stand on all those resolutions? I call it like the tyranny of the resolution. Oh, I didn't do any walking. I really feel that, you know, today is lost. You know, do you mean say it's so bad? I mean, you know, I want to diet, but, you know, somehow I'm not able to control my eating. Now, that becomes the fear, and you start putting more weight because of that. I mean, no, don't take it. The obvious ones are the more uh, worrisome, and maybe, I w maybe psychologists would call it as obsessiveness or something like that. And that's again something people should learn to handle. I'm talking about, you know, small, small things. I'll again give big students one challenge. I mean, can you really make a resolution to submit your assignment one day before, you know, and then see what sort of struggle you need to go through. But more importantly, sort of you're building a guilt in you. I don't know why. People build a guilt in you. I'm not, you know, I overeat today. So what? I mean, it's, you know, it's not going to last tomorrow. But people are worried about overeating today and like that. I mean, you know, that's where it is. And finally, okay, my simple point is I did not talk about tsunami, I did not talk about earthquake, I did not talk about, you know, <clears throat> let's say storm. I'm just talking about small, small things. And these are great disruptions and we don't know how to handle with that. 
I am sharing it with all my experience and my, all my experience observing others and uh, what I can share it with you all. So I, <clears throat> this is what. So what I would say is that, I mean, you don't have to really prepare for disruptions. You can proactively change also and you can be proactively innovative also. And uh, of course, crisis does help. Crisis is too precious to be lost. When the crisis happens, do whatever you have to do, but you don't have to wait for a crisis. And don't be like a disruption manager, you know, in an organization and just take it as it comes. Thank you.